Okay, welcome back everyone to Reflections, and like I said, we are going to look at judging or ju not judging. So many think that scholars shouldn't make moral judgments, but we can't help but being affected by our own time and our own cultures. And it's more valuable to acknowledge the limits of cultural conditioning than to pretend to a dream of objectivity. And judgments are a way of connecting with the past. And many continue to debate whether the Russian and Chinese revolutions were beneficial and whether the late 20th century reforms were good or bad. And communism brought hope to millions, um, but it also killed and imprisoned millions. So is it possible to embrace such ambiguity? And that's a very important question. So is it right for historians to make those moral judgments on historical events? You know, can one judge a completely different historical context? Um, in the U.S., with no major socialist tradition and staunch anti-communism strong in the minds of many of, of its people, is it difficult to have a fair and balanced discussion of communism? And did the communist revolutions represent an effort to achieve justice at the expense of freedom? Or are these cases uh, putting the quest for modernization above all other consideration? Some very interesting points. Uh, there to keep in mind. Now let's look at the um, uh, visual images from this chapter. Okay, smashing the old society. Uh, visual source one for chapter 21. So notice the various items beneath this youth's revolutionary feet. Uh, what do they represent to the ardent revolutionary seeking to quote unquote destroy the old world? And what groups of people were most likely to be affected by such efforts? Well, the statues of Christ and Buddha uh, represent religion. The slot machines and dice represent gambling and perhaps uh, vice in general. And the record um, maybe represents music or Western music specifically. And the people are most likely to be affected um, are those who practice religion, work in vice-related industries, and even entertainers. What elements of a new order are being constructed here in this image. Well, in the background, there's a parade or rally of Communist Party supporters, a class where people are being educated in the Communist system. Um, and even the men on the ladders are repairing or altering signs. Let's see those back there. Now, the prominence of the star, uh, the symbol of the Chinese Communist Party, um, indicates that the Communist state was at work unifying um, people in support of the state and teaching or indoctrinating the people with communist ideas. Okay, building the new society, the people's commune. So what appealing features of commune life and a communist future are illustrated in these posters? You should notice the communal facilities for eating and washing clothes as well as the drill practice of a people's militia uh, at the bottom. Well, the many appealing features depicted in this poster include the productive fields benefiting from substantial infrastructure improvements, unlike, or excuse me, like the dam in the background, um, the active industrial enterprises, well-ordered village designed and around uh, communal centers for eating, washing clothes, caring for children, um, the idyllic sense of the whole village going about their daily routine in harmony, uh, which has always been um, significant in Chinese society and the overall indication of self-sufficiency. And one of Mao's uh, chief goals was to overcome the sharp division between industrial cities and the agricultural countryside. So how is this effort illustrated in these po uh, posters? It's pretty easy. It's depicted by the two industrial buildings right with their smokestacks um, and the three iron smelting furnaces depicted in the upper right hand image right here alongside uh, the community. Okay, women, nature, and industrialization. So in what ways does this poster reflect Chinese communism's core values? Well, working at night indicates mastery over the natural order, right? And the large construction project symbolizes rapid industrialization. And the women working as stonemasons, which is a trade traditionally dominated by men, represents the mobilization of women to build socialism right alongside their male counterparts. And the caption of the poster really reinforces the same ideas uh, in words. So how is the young woman in this image portrayed? 
And what does the expression on her face convey? You notice her clothing, the shape of her forearms, um, and the general absence of a feminine figure. So why do you think she's portrayed um, in such this fashion, in, in such a way? What does this suggest about the communist attitude towards sexuality? Well, the young woman, um, she's portrayed as confident, skilled, enthusiastic, and engaged in her work. Her facial expression conveys a sense of happiness, concentration, confidence. And this largely uh, sexless fashion downplays the issue of gender. And it implies that workers are not regarded in gender terms and that the new communist system challenged traditional gender roles. So notice the um, lights that illuminate a nighttime work scene. And what does that suggest about attitudes toward work and production? Well, work and production were a paramount to the importance of industry in China. And what does this suggest about attitudes toward work and production? Well, work and production were uh, very important, more so than leisure or ensuring a traditional family life. Uh, the communist push to industrialize sought to overcome rather than live within the constraints of nature. Okay, the cult of Mao. So what relationship between Mao and his young followers does the poster suggest? And why might some scholars have uh, seen a quasi-religious dimension to that relationship? Well, the poster suggests a relationship of adulation, affection, hero worship even, on the part of Mao's young followers. And Mao's posed as a benevolent and approachable leader or teacher. So the adulation of the young people and the centrality of the red treasured book, right, all of them on the red treasured books, um, like the writings of other religious leaders, offers a guide to living one's life and the proper uh, life choices, lending a quasi-religious dimension uh, to the poster. So how do you understand the significance of that red treasured book of quotations from Mao, on which the young are, you know, waving around. Oops, sorry. Well, the prominence of the book reflects its importance in the movement, emphasizes it as a role, um, as a moral guide, and represents the wisdom that Mao possessed. So how might you account for the unbridled enthusiasm expressed by the Red Guards? In this case, the poster portrays the realities of these uh, rallies with considerable accuracy. Can you think of other compar comparable cases of such mass enthusiasm? Well, the Red Guard's enthusiasm was the result of the creation of a cult of personality, in part through images like the one in this poster. And they were inspired by Mao's teachings, as found in that Red Treasured book. And they were also enthusiastic about the education of the youth. And some of the comparable cases of mass enthusiasm can be seen with popular national, nationalist leaders like Gandhi, charismatic spiritual leaders like even some popes, but also tyrannical political leaders like Mussolini or Hitler. Interesting thoughts there. And that is the end of Chapter 21, Revolution, Socialism, and Global Conflict. I will see you guys again for Chapter 22, The End of Empire. The Global South on the global stage.